All right, so today for our special topics IoT course, we have a special guest. Uh, Matthew Miller is here. He's one of the leaders in the Fedora open source space. So he's here to tell us uh, all about open source uh, and, you know, how it works, the benefits, you know, what you can do to get involved, hopefully, and, um, you know, wherever else he wants to take it, you know. So I've told him that you guys are all very um, participative and you're going to ask lots of questions. So he's anticipating that. I think we've built in some time for that. So. I really, um, you know, encourage you to really understand this. It's an important area moving forward. Um, it's going to continue to have a lot of value. I mean, you use it every day in your projects. You know, we're using it with Fedora on the Raspberry Pis, um, and hopefully, in moving forward in the future, you guys will take advantage of it as well in whatever you do, whether it be professional work, whether it be fun, hobbyist stuff. Um, and hopefully you become uh, participants in this uh, this open source movement. So with that, Matthew, thank you very much and welcome. Hi, uh, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here, I'm excited about this. Um, as everybody knows, it's weird times right now. So I'm stuck at home, my family here, I've got two teenage daughters. Um, it's okay, we've got, we've got enough space for everybody to be separate, but um, those daughters are going a little bit crazy with everything, and particularly my high school aged one. Uh, we, uh, so, uh, we, I was, she was asking me about what I'm, what I'm doing here during all this, you know, she's suddenly interested about my job all of a sudden because she's kind of, you know, seeing me in the house, uh, where she's normally at school. Uh, and I was talking about doing this course and she got very excited about it. My plan was to do this basically just a conversation from my notes, uh, but, um, they got very excited and took those notes and made a whole slideshow from them. So I'm going to present from the slides she made from my notes. So that's going to be kind of fun because um, I don't actually know the exact content of all these slides because we just finished this up a, a little bit before now, um, which uh, it, it's, it's going to be exciting. Um, uh, I think it's a good thing. She They kind of sent her home with... Um, enrichment activities rather than actual academics because nobody expected to have a pandemic going on and so the school system's not quite ready for it. So she feels like the uh, school work which doesn't count is not, um, she wants to put a lot of her time into. So she's been doing a lot of Minecraft, uh, which which is fine, but I was glad she got excited about this because it, it helps us for this and um, it's actually kind of educational. I think maybe she learned something, but we'll, we'll see what happens as I go through the slides. So I'm going to try the slide share here. See what happens. Do we have slide sharing at this point? I do not see anything yet. Okay, let me, let me try this a different way. It's Okay. Got it. Okay, cool. Um, and then we'll go to present mode. Okay. Um, is that working properly still? It is. Ooh, look at that transition. That's wonderful. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, talk by me, slides by Glenn Miller. That's my daughter. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of open source. I'm going to talk about myself, talk a little bit about the Fedora project and some other open source projects, then talk a little bit about how all of this can help you personally, and then we'll do some questions. But please feel free to interrupt me for questions at any time. Um, I, like I said, was planning a conversation here and still am, slides are not. So, uh, there we go. All right, um, brief history of open source. So, a long, long time ago in the 80s, um, we start out with Richard Stallman at MIT. And uh, at the time, uh, in the original early days of, of software and computers, there wasn't really much of an idea of who owned all of the software. There was just computers and hackers building things on it and so on. But as, um, you know, 
uh, things got from the early hacker days into actually being, you know, an industry, um, uh, that kind of changed and things become more regulated and copyright started coming into it and personal computers and people started selling software. And so a lot of the people from that early hacker collaborative culture started feeling like this idea of the software belongs to some company isn't how they wanted the world to be. Uh, so uh, Richard Stallman and some other people started this idea of the GNU project, which is a terrible um, pun name. Um, but basically the idea of we can build up this operating system thing that um, you know is is out there. We can build up a whole computer operating system and all the software we need in this sharing collaborative way. Uh, so uh, kind of started this movement in the 80s and it was kind of a quixotic thing and um, they, but a lot of important software was built there, text editors, compilers, all those kind of things. Um, he started the Free Software Foundation which is an organization basically dedicated to this idea of um, sharing software and came up with this uh, pretty clever license called the uh, GNU GPL General Public License, uh, which uses copyright to um, give the idea of um, you can take the software, you can use it, but you have to, if you make any modifications, share those modifications with other people. So it basically is a license which says, um, if you want to use this software, uh, the and if you want to modify the software, you can have all these freedoms. But the basic rule is you want to uh, collaborate and share those freedoms with with everybody else. So this was cool, and a lot of hacker people started working on this kind of thing. Um, but it was mostly constrained to the hacker world because um, it generally ran on you know, proprietary um, Unix systems. It wasn't necessarily something that would run on your home computer and things like that. At least not in the early days. And um, it kind of kind of stayed in the academic and hacker culture rather than getting out into the world. One of the problems with that is that it wouldn't run on you know an individual computer that a, a normal human being could have at home. Uh, so by the time I got to the 90s, uh, something awesome happened, and that is a student in Finland, uh, Linus Torvalds. Uh, this is stuff I hope I'm going quickly because I think you probably know all of this stuff, but just, it's important background. Um, was working on a home project um, using the Minix operating system, which was a little uh, small version of Unix created for academic and learning use. Uh, people used it to, you know, in their courses in the university to figure out how to make an operating system. Um, he uh, started um, not with, with that code, but with the ideas from that and started making something to run on his PC he had at home just so he would have the ability to do that. And a kind of a stroke of good luck and fortune. Like this was right when the internet was first starting to really take off. And he took this and posted it on the internet and then um, was quickly convinced that this, um, the GPL sharing license was the right way to do this. Um, and because of the, the timing of all this, uh, it really took off and uh, other people started contributing to it and it has snowballed into this thing that we know today is the Linux operating system that is um, the operating system that is the most common and everywhere in the world, and you know this class, everybody in it's hacking on it, and doing things. So pretty familiar with that. Um, but uh, this this was kind of the missing piece, this kernel of an operating system, uh, plus the GNU utilities, and then a bunch of other things like the X window system and other libraries, BSD things from around the world, kind of all came together to make a functional operating system. And in a lot of ways, this and but the internet uh, kind of became the explosion of open source as a successful thing because we had a whole operating system that you could actually put on your own computer. And at the same time as uh, people were working on, you know, building up in the, the research project internet into the big commercial everywhere utility internet we have today, uh, it turned out that um, Linux was the it was a great operating system for building all the servers that um, need, were needed to make this go. And like the proprietary Unixes were too slow in moving and weren't, uh, were too expensive for the little startup companies that were making all of this happen. So um, Linux and the internet really rose together. And of course, the internet enables the collaboration that makes Linux happen. So um, it, was, it was just really perfectly timed for all this to happen. Um, let me uh, let me pause there. Does anybody have any questions about all that history? Is it uh, is it is it something everybody knows?
Well, I, I don't have any questions. I'm good. <laughs> okay, <laughs> just just check in. Uh, I think that's basic basic knowledge. Um, so um, fast forward to you know, kind of kind of the '90s here. So um, in in the, in the early '90s, mid '90s, uh, Linux was starting to really take off as a server server operating system. Um, but it was still kind kind of a fringe thing. Um, meanwhile, there was a whole thing called the browser wars, where uh, there was Netscape Navigator, and then Microsoft introduced Internet Explorer, and um, there was a whole thing with Microsoft getting sued over being monopolistic over that. All sorts of stuff happened, and um, in the midst of this, um, a guy named Eric Raymond. Um, wrote this essay called The Cathedral and the Bazaar, which is kind of about software development models, about this idea of um, whether you build software you know, from an elaborate plan in a central organization, or whether it works better, or um, if you have a bunch of people who are kind of collaborating on their own different, uh, different interests that kind of build something together like a grand bazaar that actually can ultimately get bigger and better. And so some of the people who uh, at, at um, Mozilla, at a Netscape company, read this and decided that um, this was the way forward to kind of the solution to the browser wars in one way. And then they decided to open, open source Netscape Navigator, and that later became uh, Mozilla and Firefox. Uh, and that was uh, just a, a huge uh, it's a watershed moment for the idea of open source and free software and the idea that something that had been uh, this uh, really popular, very instrumental uh, consumer software, uh, that open source was good for that too, really kind of shifted uh, shifted sort of the, the narrative of things and made, uh, kind of set into motion how, how I think the world has gone from then, which is kind of an interesting thing. Um, it turns out that Eric Raymond is kind of a horrible person with some blatantly racist beliefs. We didn't know that at the time. It's still a good essay, but um, yeah, pe people are fallible. Be, be careful with your heroes, I guess. But uh, uh, this was an important essay and an important uh, and um, important thing in the world. Yeah, Firefox, Mozilla here. Um, so this going open source, um, really, again, this meshed well with the internet and the idea of the internet as a collaborative place and sharing and something that belongs to us as people. Um, back in, in the 90s, before the internet took off, um, there were a bunch of different services. In, uh, America Online was not, not an internet provider, but a thing you would dial up into, and it was a walled garden of, um, you know, applications that um, you know they you would pay America online to have your application there and you could have a forum on this thing and there were a lot of these different services and each one thought they were going to be the you know center of the universe the arbiter of people's you know consumption of online content and uh, none of those succeeded but this open collaborative sharing internet uh, really did and took off underneath it um, and a lot of that kind of fits with this idea of open source and building the software in the same way. Uh, there's probably another topic on that about how um, in the world now of Facebook and Google and all the you know, big internet um, social media companies kind of dominating our experience of the internet, um, whether who won in the end there. But for a time, at least, we had this very idealistic um, open internet built on open source and running you know, open source infrastructure and with you know users at the end running open source. So um, that that was kind of a neat time, and I think that it's still it, it's still here and still very important to how we as people uh, own our content, have you know privacy and security uh, because of open source as concept in the way these things are built. All right. Yeah, uh, this is who I work for, a disclaimer, Red Hat. Um, but this this is pretty interesting as well, because so Red Hat is a company that makes um, a lot of software now, but Linux infrastructure software. And the first thing that they made uh, was uh, Red Hat Linux. So when now now it's Red Hat Enterprise Linux. But in, in the 90s, they had a thing called Red Hat Linux, which you could go to a big box store uh, micro Center or wherever, and you could buy a CD with Red Hat Linux on it. 
But it turned out that that is not a very good way to make a lot of money. And uh, they were kind of, you know, business model. They were making more money from T-shirts than from actually selling the software, I believe, um, at least at least somewhere along those lines. I don't know if that's actually true, but it, but it certainly felt that way. Um, and uh, so so that wasn't wasn't working out. Um, and so they decided uh, to make a pivot in early 2000s and decided to go completely for the enterprise and to make this as software that would replace um, Unix, proprietary Unix, Solaris, IRIX, uh, um, digital Unix, uh, AIX, those kind of things that were owned by big companies in, in the data center and to really go after that market. And so um, this has succeeded remarkably well up until uh, recently Red Hat was bought by IBM for $34 billion, right, it says here on the slide even. Um, uh, and it's just an amazing, uh, amazing success story in selling services around open source software. So this isn't meant to be a plug for my employer. It's just a, um, a great example of um, the idea that uh, open source and all of this sharing and actually you know, making money and a profit can, can fit together actually quite successfully um, if you can find the right model to go around that. So actually I'll talk a little bit about those models a little bit a little bit further on. But obviously um, this uh, Red Hat being such a success in open source and making so much money uh, kind of showed people that this is something that it does, it isn't just for hobbyists, um, although hobbyists are important to it and still are, but this is something that uh, people take seriously, you know, for the enterprise as well. Um, and uh, as we as we get forward today, um, Linus Torvalds, the guy who invented the Linux kernel, also made a source control management system called Git, uh, which is basically uh, something to help. To, it's designed in a distributed fashion to help with that collaboration for open source. So there were version control software uh, before, but the the previous version control software was generally aimed at models where uh, there was one central version of that and the people who you know uh, would control it controlled the central repository, which works fine for this cathedral style development, but is not so great for open source distributed model. So uh, Git wasn't the first piece of software to work that way, but it obviously is um, the most successful and became dominant. And uh, GitHub is a company that's built a and now they're owned by Microsoft, uh, a company that's, that built you know, tools uh, that uh, provide kind of a central repository, but also enable sharing and, and forking and cloning. And you can see from the, the graph here, um, that has gone you know, exponential growth and is um, everywhere. And the, the interesting thing about this is sometime between um, the 90s when we were hearing things like open source is cancer and it's communism and whatever, open source has actually become just the default. When you start with software, you pretty much put it under on GitHub and you pick an open source license. Uh, so somewhere along the line, without even noticing, open source kind of won. It's, it's the default. There's not really any question, should I open source this anymore? But it's how should I open source this and how should I build a model around it? Um, and we're actually even getting to the point where um, you know, we have, have several new generations of people. It just seems so much that it's the default that people are thinking, why do we even need these crazy open source licenses with all of these rules? Isn't just sharing the thing? Um, it turns out it's not. Those licenses are very important. And if you, uh, I think there's gonna be some interesting lessons to be learned for all the people who think that um, you can get away with not having a license. Um, we can talk about that some more if you like, but uh, picking a good license for your project is, is very important. Um, don't write your own license because it's hard to get all the legal nuances right. And we already have several hundred of them. Um, pick one that fits the open source definition and uh, use that for your project. Basically, you've got um, the GPL style licenses, which enforce sharing and BSD MIT style licenses, which are more open and don't have that you need to share back clause. Uh, those tend to be preferred by companies who want to be able to um, make products without having to carefully follow all these licensing terms. Uh, if you do work on a project under a license like that, it's still socially right to do the sharing back. But in any case, 
the license is actually very important because it is the glue under which all of this infrastructure works. It's kind of the legal framework for it. And without a legal framework, uh, things are going to fall apart at some point. So, uh, yeah, it's still important even in these days. But um, it is uh, it is the default everywhere as well. All right, that that that's the end of my uh, brief history of open source. Uh, any any questions about that? I, I think just living through it gives you a much different perspective, you know, and uh, I came from the proprietary world, so I didn't see a lot of the open source side. Finally, in the proprietary world, we transitioned over to the open source world. We weren't a very good uh, sharer either. We would just take the ones uh, with the uh, um, the BSD licenses, <laughs> use, uh, abuse, never give back, you know, and I think uh, the company I'm, that I did this with probably is doing the same thing still to this day. But overall, I mean, the benefits were incredible. And I mean, just living through it, I, you know, the history is, it's always fun to, to re-see this because I don't really remember it because I didn't, wasn't exposed to a lot of it. So thank you. Yeah. Um, and I think it's, it's true. There still are a lot of companies that, you know, just take things under BSD license or under GPL license in careful situations and don't contribute back. But, um, there are a lot of benefits to companies in doing that sharing back, um, which is the same benefits that come to individuals, which is we share the burden of all this work where that, where that software is important to you, but is not really a differentiator for your business. Then it makes so much more sense to have that as something we all work together and collaborate on because you then don't need to have a whole project and team around it yourself. You can put some amount of effort into it and then we all work together to make it better and kind of um, you know, the rising tide lifts all of the boats, I guess. And, you know, we still see, uh, you know, some people who are selfish and people who are bad actors, but um, it has really come to be, um, you know, we, we can expect, you know, even, um, you know, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, um, open source is still is, is the default for those companies now, too, because these benefits are uh, so there. All right, here's the talking about myself part, uh, and we're gonna we're gonna start. Uh, I, I won't make this make this too long, but um, I, I think it, some of it's relevant to IoT, so that's that's the connection here. Uh, this is an Apple II. It was um, the computer that I first learned to do anything on. Um, I I grew up fairly poor, didn't have money for a computer at home, but my my elementary school when I was in fourth grade, every classroom had two computers that were in the hallway outside that classroom, and you could you know, sign up for time to use them. And uh, so the Apple II uh, was not a powerful machine. It had 48K of uh, RAM, like K, kilobytes. And um, yeah, as my daughter noted here on the slide, it didn't have lowercase letters because it that would have been like way too sophisticated. It just had uppercase letters. There were some like aftermarket hacks you could do to make it provide lowercase, but there wasn't even a caps lock key because caps were all it was. Um, so uh, this device w was in the hallway there and um, I, I became intrigued with it. And so, oh, uh, uh, this is the slide she picked here. Yeah, this is what a computer game looked like for, for this computer, but actually there were actually graphics as well. Um, and it had a really interesting graphics card where it was like um, you could either do low resolution, which was basically each each letter cell here, 40 letters wide by 20 letters or less than that, 20 letters down, something like that. And you could use those to make low resolution blocky graphics or you could do a high resolution graphics mode and high resolution meant, I think, 280 by 192 or something like that. Very, very low. And um, this machine was made by uh, Steve Wozniak, one of the founders of Apple. Uh, Steve Jobs is the Steve that you probably know about as the Apple uh, marketing genius. But uh, Wozniak was the hardware genius. And uh, this is uh, this computer was available, became so widespread and so cheap because he was so good at using so few chips to make things work with really clever hardware hacks. 
And the high resolution graphics in this are incredibly, like I'm trying to remember, it, it had six colors. It had um, white and black and then an orange and a green and a blue and a purple. But uh, because of the way it worked, um, the orange and the green could only be on odd numbered pixels and the blue and the red. So uh, because um, of the cost saving measures to make the hardware be very efficient and affordable, um, the graphics were uh, the very, very strange. But uh, to me, this is actually an amazing advantage because I, as a fourth grader, could look at this and I could say, I could make a game like that. And, I, um, and this is called Tranquility Base. I encourage you to look up YouTube videos of how this game looks. Um, you can see the, the color graphics thing I'm talking about. Um, but yeah. Uh, and so next to this computer, there was a stack of books that was Learn to Program. It was like six different kind of thin books, but going different levels of learning uh, basic. And another awesome thing about this machine is that if you put a if you put a floppy disk in it and boot it up, it would start running the software on that floppy disk. Um, it didn't have a hard drive, of course, because um, I think those were were things that existed, but they weighed like you know 500 pounds and lived in a data center. Um, but it also had you know, on on its ROM, its built-in memory, a version of BASIC built into it. So if you would boot up this computer with nothing in it, it would actually come to a prompt that was the BASIC programming language prompt. It basically booted up to a tell me what to do. And then these books were instructions for how to tell the computer what to do. So I actually started coming in an hour early to school. The janitor would let me in. And I would start, you know, learn, taught myself to program with these books and, and, you know, with the idea of making some of these games like uh, this and like, you know, Oregon Trail and um, things. And, you know, I never really made any great games, but I was able to make some games and impress my friends and really kind of uh, had uh, the fun of it. And, and the, the thing was the games that I could make were almost on the level of the professional games that people could make. So I could look at this and I'd be like, I can do something with computers. Uh, and today, uh, when, you know, my daughter playing Minecraft looks at, you know, at making a computer game, um, I, I've, I've done some things where I've gone to elementary schools and taught, you know, Scratch, taught some basic programming language things. And one of the universal problems I see that people have is that you know, kids look at this and they're like, okay, that's cool. How do I make Fortnite? And, you know, they, or they look at, you know, these other games that literally cost millions of dollars of time and effort and graphics assets and, you know, composers and rendering and all of these things. And it, those things are not attainable to a kid. Like maybe you could go through a career and become somebody who does one little part of making some sort of game like that, but it's not a thing you can make. So that's one of the reasons I'm so excited about Internet of Things in the small hacker sense. Um, Arduino and all these kind of things and, you know, your Raspberry Pi, because you can look at these things and you can say, okay, I understand how I can make this, uh, you know, make a sensor that makes, you know, the lights go on or off. I can make a musical instrument. I can make something that, uh, you know, uh, sends messages to my sister. These are things that you can look at this device and figure out how to do it. So I'm, I'm very excited about Internet of Things as an important thing for bringing the next generation of you know, human beings who are interested in controlling and making computers do something that they want to do, rather than just being um, consumers of products, consumers of media, people who play games but can't imagine that they can make those games. So uh, IoT, I think, is going to be fundamental to that. I'm excited that everybody in this class you pro probably think this is, is true as well, or you wouldn't be here. Uh, so uh, that's kind of how I got started with, with computers in general. Um, all right, so another thing that, that happened to me, uh, as I eventually did get a PC at home, uh, and I wanted to learn programming that was a little bit beyond you know, the basic. Uh, again, the PC came with something called GW Basic. It was fine. Um, and but I wanted to learn a little bit more. But the problem was a C compiler to you know, do real programming uh, was expensive, like hundreds of dollars uh, for a C compiler. And um, that really that kind of put that out of reach to me. It was kind of something I would I would again, I was a geeky kid. I'd go to the library. I'd read Byte magazine. It was a very, very 
very well done magazine um, for computer professionals, and I would kind of imagine having access to all these things. But it, it seemed out of reach to me um, until somebody at my church actually gave me uh, a, some, a stack of floppy disks with something on it called DJ GPP. DJ actually works at Red Hat now. It's awesome. But this is a version of that GNU Free Software Foundation compiler um, from back back in the the first slides that was made to run on MS DOS on the you know the PC computer that I had. And so this was a suite of, co of command line tools that would let me write programs in C. Um, for free without anybody charging. And it, this came under that, you know, new general public license. So this is my first exposure to that and kind of the advantages of that, the accessibility that provided, you know, in, in computing to me. And you know, this idea of, you know, no, but nobody's making money for this. They're making the world a better place. So that was pretty cool. I never became a great C programmer from this, but just having that accessible and making some little utilities and toys and um, some games that definitely crash the computer because memory management turns out to be hard. Um, there's a reason people use higher level languages than C, but um, I had a lot of fun and learned a lot from that. Um, okay, and so that that helped launch my career into uh, free soft into, into software stuff. I helped build an ISP with one of my friends. We this is a screenshot of it. I designed this web page, people. Uh, so it's probably good I didn't end up a web designer in in my career. Uh, the, the ISP is long gone, but um, we had started doing this, building it on Windows uh, Windows NT because this was you know um, the uh, that that was the thing I knew as a consumer product at the time. Um, but we were having problems with it crashing all the time. It wasn't flexible and so on. And um, I had read a little bit about Linux, and then I remembered you know, um, this uh, free compiler that I used earlier, and I thought, ah, this is kind of in the same vein of that. So we rebuilt this ISP with Linux in the you know, mid you know, late 90s by this point, and, and rebuilt it all with this Linux operating system, and I kind of got involved in that. And... Uh, again, uh, I, I learned this, you know, uh, through the community of, you know, there, I didn't have any classes about this or anything. Nobody did at that time. Um, I learned this, you know, from people on the internet and kind of started getting involved, talking to people and chatting, got involved in the community around um, first Slackware Linux and then Red Hat Linux that uh, was, was the first distribution we used for this ISP. Um, and then from that, I ended up getting a job at Boston University, and at Boston University, this is around, this is around 1999. Uh, at the time, uh, Red Hat, I, I saw a study that showed that um, they, they did a comparison of the security of different Linux distributions. And Red Hat Linux happened to be the most secure because they put it on a network and it took 15 minutes before somebody had broken into that system. Uh, which is to say they weren't very secure at all. Uh, so I worked for the central IT department and I was doing systems administration for Solaris and IREX proprietary Unix systems. Uh, but I noticed our security team was spending a lot of time going around telling the different, the, uh, different departments and so on that they, this uh, Linux server that they'd stood up under their desk had to be shut down because it wasn't, in, it wasn't secure Somebody had broken into it yet again, and so um, I, I was I was thinking about this and uh, thinking about you know the advantages that Linux had brought to me, and I saw that these departments were really you know they were trying to solve their problems. They couldn't afford another Solaris machine. They couldn't, or even even in those times, the things they were trying to do, the people they were talking to on the internet were using Linux to do it. So I made a pitch that we could, since this is open source, I could take this, uh, take Red Hat Linux and I could tailor it for the university. So I made it so that it was much more secure. There was no uh, account called printer with the password of printer, those kind of things that like people, people hadn't thought some of the basics about um, what problems might arise. So we looked at all of those problems and kind of tightened down the security, added SSH to it for secure connection between machines, and add a connection to our central file server, central accounts, and made this version of a Linux operating system that was available to uh, to the campus and basically told people, 
uh, instead of uh, the security team, instead of telling them you can't run Linux, they said, hey, if you want to run Linux, please run this one because this Linux distribution is made for Boston University. And so um, this was this was fun. It was a big success, and I worked on that for a couple of years. And it was kind of neat to, um, to see um, how that, again, the ability to tailor the open source software to what we needed for the university made it made it possible to do things that we certainly couldn't have done with other operating systems. And we were able to do it you know, with our own resources, with no cost to the university besides what turned out to be considerable time for me and five or six other people, but I think time well spent. So um, during that time, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Just a question, Matthew. I guess um, you know how how long to break in on your version versus the original fifteen minutes? Um, Did you actually? Yeah. Test oh, them? that's an excellent question. Um, we had one incident during the eight years of running that um, that I am aware of of somebody breaking into a Boston University Linux system, and that was due to a misconfiguration, which wasn't in the original setup. So we did a good job. I guess so. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, okay. thanks. <laughs> Excellent question. Um, so um, as part of this, um, I had said earlier that uh, there's the big advantages in making sure that you give back. So we based our thing on Red Hat Linux and later on the Fedora uh, Linux distribution and on CentOS. And we ended up, um, to make those security changes, we changed, I think, about 100 different packages we made alterations to. and uh, every alteration we made was expensive for us because our small team, every time there was an update to that software or a new version came out, we needed to make sure we would you know, backport and reapply that alteration. So uh, I got involved with the Fedora project and helped try to bring some of those security changes and other just convenience things that we needed to the upstream project. Um, I don't know if everybody's familiar with this concept of upstream and downstream. It's uh, open source terminology that's uh, second nature to me, but you know, software flows from the upstream into downstreams and products and so on. Uh, upstream, you go to the source. And so uh, that's uh, what I did with a lot of these changes we were making. Um, and so some of the things like uh, the configuration where when you're using your system and you type sudo to get access to root, uh, rather than logging into root separately all the time was one of the things we did for security in Linux, and I helped get that into Fedora, um, and there's a th another thing where um, if you try and remove packages that if you remove them, your system won't boot, it tells you to please don't do that. You are shooting yourself in the foot. Uh, we got some of those changes in because um, as that was things we learned as trying to support this, um, reducing our own support costs was, was a, not letting our users shoot themselves in the foot so easily. Um, you certainly can reconfigure it if you really, really want to do that, but by default, it protects the system. And so um, we got that change into um, into the package management in Fedora, and that's in RHEL now as well. Uh, other other things like that. Um, so um, through that, I got involved in the Fedora project and kind of helped uh, sort of met the community and started to get you know the changes we needed for Boston University into the upstream, basically from a selfish point of view, so that um, the next time that software was updated, our changes were already there and we didn't have to do the work. Um, but also from that, um, our changes ended up benefiting a lot of other people. Uh, so somehow, in between, after all that, I ended up becoming the Fedora project leader. Um, I got involved in, in the project there. I worked at Harvard for a little bit and then uh, went to work at uh, Red Hat on Fedora's cloud initiative and just started kind of looking at the project. And um, when the role opened up, I applied for it and got it. Um, this is a job where um, I kind of try to help keep the whole project organized. And I end up doing a lot of calls like this with a lot of different people, a lot of talking, a lot of listening to people, and a lot of writing persuasive essays about how I think things should be, because um, this project is not structured as a top-down, people-do-what-I-say project, but as a community, uh, again, that bizarre approach where people are doing the own things they're interested in, and my role is to try and help keep everybody coordinated, working nicely together, and keep the strategy all aligned together. Um, yeah, so that's the that's that's the end of the about me section there. Anybody have any questions about that?
Okay. Uh, I, I hope that's because I provided you all the interesting information there is, and not that I'm not that I'm boring here. But, uh, uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the Fedora project itself and how that works. Um, so Fedora, I talked a little bit about um, upstreams. Uh, Fedora serves as the upstream for the Red Hat Enterprise Linux product that Red Hat sells. So uh, Fedora is a community project. Red Hat invests a lot into it, but uh, um, the majority of people who are working on Fedora actually don't work for Red Hat. They are working on something that they care about and are part of the community because uh, they like the collaboration and because Fedora enables them to work together to get that collaboration and get the thing they work on um, to more people. Uh, our mission basically is to make our community able to make these solutions for users. It's kind of a um, snake eating its own tail mission. Um, but we kind of, as a project, want to focus on our community of operating system builders. So I think that's a, a lot of people in this class and the Raspberry Pi operating system that you're working on. Um, and I, uh, I I know there's some places you're stuck with that. I'm, uh, I'll see what I can do to help you a little bit more. But that thing you're doing is really right in line with our mission. And um, we are actually, we're, we're learning some from your difficulties in doing that. So I'm sorry about the difficulties, but uh, thank, thank you for exposing them for us because that really is something we want to do more and more. Let me see if my daughter made slides for these specific things. No, she didn't. Um, so uh, some of the other things we put together, um, Fedora Workstation, that's the system for laptops. That's our main um, you know, thing that most people consume Fedora as. We also have Fedora Core OS, which is a operating system that's tailored for containers, and Fedora IoT, probably of some interest to this class. Um, but in a lot of ways, Fedora IoT is not necessarily tailored for the hacker space. It's a little more aimed at the edge computing case because a lot of the um, people we have interested in this are uh, some very big companies that are actually deploying millions of these devices around the world. And their, uh, so their, their interests in this are a little bit different than somebody building a home hacker case. And um, one of the things I'm trying to balance as a user, as a Fedora project leader, um, those users and the hackers and the kids doing their things, um, you know, uh, the, the next generation of fourth graders hacking on making something interesting, I really would like them to have a welcome place in this. Uh, and that kind of is hard to balance and sometimes with the, um, you know, millions of, of devices, enterprise use case that um, the, the IoT project, you know, uh, edition is, is going towards a little more. Um, so we're, we're still working on figuring that out. Um, and so I think there's maybe room for something that sits next to Fedora IoT, like the Raspberry Pi oriented thing you, you're working on um, that can actually be a, a solution that's separate from the Fedora IoT thing in Fedora. Um, so those top ones are kind of our big things, but we also have a lot of smaller things. One of them, um, the Fedora Python Classroom Lab, which basically is a system you boot up and it has a bunch of Python programming tools right there for you. This is actually used by some other professors to teach Python programming. Um, so that, that's kind of a neat thing. Uh, Fedora Robotics Suite, I don't think has a lot of users. Um, but those users uh, for a couple years running actually won World Cup robot soccer running Fedora on their robots. Um, so that, that's pretty awesome. Uh, the final one is Fedora Security Lab. I see it's missing its B here. We'll have to fix that. That's kind of our answer to Kali Linux for um, doing the security testing penetration kind of thing. So we kind of try and solve all, um, there, there are people in the Fedora community who are interested in all of these different use cases and uh, the job of the project overall is to try our best to enable the people who are working on those use cases to deliver their solutions. Um, okay, so th that's that's the distro. It's kind of the result of the project. Um, this is some pictures of uh, some of the people in the Fedora project community around the world um, from our Flock to Fedora conference and from some other Fedora events. There are about 4,000 people who contribute to Fedora in some way or another every year. Although a lot of those contributions are just uh, small uh, one-off one patches here or there, a wiki edit, a document improvement. Um, so there's kind of a long tail of small contributions, which are very important, 
um, and then maybe two to three hundred core people who are involved every week and really are, are the uh, drivers of a lot of the a lot of the work. Um, but there's kind of an important balance because we need those small contributions and that wider community is important as well. Um, I like to talk about Fedora as the community. We would just say Fedora uh, and Fedora Linux or Fedora Workstation, one of those things as the product rather than um, Fedora as an operating system. This is maybe a pet, pet um, project of mine to kind of get that focus changed because to me, the community aspect is actually more important than the technology aspect because the technology is going to be great when the community is great and when we can work together and do all the things that we're trying to do, the, the, the uh, awesome technology will follow. Um, and uh, all of those things that people do are actually, um, uh, my, my daughter was going through this list and she's like, there's a lot of things here. Uh, yes, that's exactly it. Uh, so it's, you know, uh, a lot of people think programming, hacking is mostly what's needed in Fedora. It actually turns out that um, websites, design, um, you know, QA, obviously, as a more technical thing, but you know, documentation, blogging about what's going on, communications, uh, translating things, all of this stuff is I don't know, 80% of the work is is these kind of things. Uh, and so there's so much to do in an open source project where that um, I think probably because you're in this class, everyone here is more technically oriented, but there's a lot of room for people, no matter what your interests are, to get involved in an open source project. Um, and even within different you know interests in a technical area, there's a lot of different ways to go. It isn't just kind of what you think of as I'm hacking on an operating system work. Um, any questions about Fedora before I go on to the next section? Uh, yeah, Matthew, just one thing, I guess, would just, is it, how do you define the boundaries, you know, of what Fedora is responsible for versus other open source projects? Is there a crisp definition? Is it just the OS? Are there, you know, utilities, things that go along with it? I mean, so where's the boundary, I guess? So compilers, are they part, they're part of Fedora as well? I mean, so how do you, delineate, you know, Fedora versus other open source projects? Yeah, that's a great question. Let me go back to the mission slide back here. Um, so we are definitely focused on building the platform layer and we're really ultimately an integration project. So something like a compiler, um, getting your comp the compiler available to users through Fedora is part of Fedora's remit. But making a new compiler or even, you know, fixing bugs in the compiler, or certainly adding new features to the compiler is something that if that's your interest, we would send you to the project for that compiler itself. And then Fedora helps take those things that exist in the open source world and integrate them together into a whole that's consumable by people in an easy solution sort of way. In, in general, um, Things, yeah, you know, think things that make that solution um, consumable as an OS. That that that's what Fedora is about. And things that are um, you know, tools on top of that um, might be important in Fedora, but they generally exist as their own project outside on the upstream from Fedora. Is that covered? Sure, that, for? Yeah, exactly. But you look at something like say Fedora Workstation, but that's mostly integration, a lot of other things that come along with it, right? So it's just, it's a little different when you look at that one versus say core OS. Um, and right now Fedora IoT is probably, um, it's a lot more constrained workstation, right? More or less. And um, so as a result, that's a little different as well, right? So it's, um, it, it, it's, it's very interesting. And um, I think you probably walk some fine lines here to, to figure out what goes where and what really you want to be responsible for, I would think. Yeah, absolutely. It's often often a little bit fuzzy, and it sometimes comes down to who who the people are involved in the different projects. So, for example, for on on the desktop with Fedora Workstation, the upstream project for the graphical environment is the GNOME project, um, and Red Hat is separately from Fedora, a big investment investor in the GNOME project. And then there's a Red Hat desktop team which works on Fedora Workstation and also works in the GNOME upstream. So some of the lines get blurred there a little bit, whether they're doing their work on Fedora or on the GNOME upstream. 
again, we try and do things upstream as much as possible, but sometimes there are things that make sense at the integration level that are you know, things that are going to land in Fedora first, and then other people may figure out how to use them. Um, and uh, we often, a lot of that stuff, uh, so some of the work that's being done around Pipewire, for example, which is a video and audio streaming solution for the desktop, um, that stuff work is being done you know, at Red Hat, being worked on in Fedora, but is also going to benefit everybody else. It's not really a Fedora specific thing. Um, yeah, and and in CoreOS, in a lot of ways, you know, that's integrating Podman and container tools and OS tree and a bunch of things that you know are, are their own little upstream projects um, that kind of work together. And CoreOS is where they're all pulled together in a functional solution. Probably hear more about those tools from Langdon next week as well. Excellent, thank you. All right. Um, I also wanted to go over some of the other open source projects. Is my my daughter's selection of important ones. Uh, Krita is a, a painting program that's open source, and this is actually a really interesting one because I believe this is more popular in Windows and Mac than it is on the Linux desktop, which makes sense because Linux desktop is a couple percent of the market. And those are um, much larger. But um, this is a really excellent, completely open source painting and drawing tool that uh, there um, rivals or exceeds the commercial equivalents. Um, it's really cool. Scratch is an you know, open source programming language for kids. And Darktable is a photography uh, photo uh, raw editing software. So I mean, these things are all open source, and again, um, you know, we have a whole ecosystem around that. And again, these are, um, yeah, these started out as hobby kind of things, or Scratch started out as an academic project, and they kind of grew. Um, yeah, I think these projects are software. I'm, I'm disagreeing with my daughter's title here. I'll have to give her some correction there. They are software, but they're not. You know, there's there's the application kind of software that um, is fun for people. Um, and an example, I talked about making uh, games on the Apple II. This is about 20 years old now, but um, my wife played a game on Windows called Jez Ball. And uh, when we switched our home systems to Linux, she was like, this is terrible. We don't have this game on my, on my system. So I was like, I'll write you one. So I made this game. You can find this on my website, Icebreaker here. Uh, and it involves you know, um, penguins that you're trying to trap onto icebergs. Uh, and so I made this. I made this basically for my wife, but I put it online. I um, you know, put it under GNU General Public License. I put it there. And a couple months later, someone came to me and said, here, here are some patches. I noticed your game only runs on Linux, but here are some patches that will make this run on Windows. So uh, we added, actually took those patches, and this uh, person in Italy sent me these things to make it run on Windows. So I started cross-compiling it for Windows. and um, we actually uh, found my you know, 20 year old executable download there and my daughter installed that and ran it on her current Windows system, uh, which she has for games, by the way. Don't, don't get into uh, uh, whether she should be running Linux. We'll, we'll work on her on that. But anyways, the Windows version ran on there and it was just really cool to me that this thing that I had written as this project, you know, basically from my own house, um, kind of caught on and um, somebody made it work on Windows and a, this had a huge amount of downloads for Windows over the years and it's been pretty popular. So that's a, kind of a neat example of something I did that was just you know, for my own fun that ended up, um, you know, I don't know if benefiting is really the right word because it's a waste of time, but wasting a bunch of people's time all around the world and increasing their entertainment. So that's kind of neat. You can still find this on my website if you're, if you're so inspired. Um, and then, of course, there's a lot of all the infrastructure software. This kind of goes um, to the question about, you know, what stuff is in Fedora. This is some of the software that's open source that we integrate together into Fedora. Um, and I think, actually, the, the important thing here is this middle point of, uh, again, open source being the default. Um, back, like I was saying, when, when I was young, a compiler was something that was hard to get, inaccessible. You pay a lot of money for it. Uh, these days, you know, these new programming languages, when they come out, they're open source to begin with. It's just the default. Like, if you're going to make a programming language, of course it's an open source programming language. Why would something be, you know, hidden behind a proprietary owned language? That's never going to take off. 
Uh, so uh, again, open source is really, really one in a fundamental way for how how we do development, and that's just kind of amazing to see as somebody who's you know, li lived through it. Said. And I guess um, we also have boring applications, you know, office software, uh, financial software, and so on. Um, and VS Code, which is a programmer's editor, and of course the super interesting thing here is this is from Microsoft, long, you know, seen by some people as the enemy. Um, Microsoft is now all in on open source, and even .NET programming language went open source. Uh, so. Um, Open source, it it won. That that's really the point of, of the slide, I think. Um, and then uh, this kind of goes to the product model. So um, I talked about you know Red Hat being a multi-billion-dollar company um, with the product model that they have. Um, there are kind of s several different ways to organize how you're going to make money off of open source. If you can't, um, if if it is something you you can get for free, how do you profit off of it? Uh, Red Hat does this by having a subscription, and when you have the subscription, you get a bunch of other, again, I'm not going to make this a Red Hat sales pitch, but the idea is you subscribe to the software and you get security updates, support, documentation, a whole bunch of, you know, and relationships with the company that are, provide the value. Um, some of the other open source software works on a model where um, where they do consulting. Um, that That's uh, really common for, um, I don't have the, um, through poll people here that should be here. There's a lot of um, web software that uh, basically their model is uh, we'll do custom consulting for getting this to work on on your system. It's open source, but we'll excuse me, we'll help make a solution for you. Um, other other times there is a, a product that's an enterprise product and then an open source community edition which doesn't get support, maybe gets features a little bit later. And doesn't if the development happens in the enterprise and the community edition is kind of a free trial version. Um, I'm happy that Red Hat generally doesn't do that. We use a model where we work with the upstreams and the up and the development happens in the open and the upstream. But um, that model, the community edition model, is a perfectly viable open source way to do things. And again, um, it it as open source is the default, people are figuring out different ways to make this work. All right. Um, any questions about those things? All right. That's fine. Well, let's go on to the next section, which is the how, how does this help you? Uh, so, yeah, uh, the first thing is, of course, you know, kind of I was talking about you can you can hack on something that's fun. Um, and this is actually uh, my daughter wrote this slide of kind of uh, we were talking about this and we we're talking about making games and things. And one of the things that she pointed out is kind of what I was talking about in making my game work for Windows. Uh, when you work in a collaborative manner like this, you don't have to do everything yourself. You can if, if you don't have skills in a certain area, you can find people who can do the graphics, find people maybe who are better programmers than you are or different programmers than you are, work on different things and work on this together. Um, and kind of you can make a project that you care about um, come into reality in a way that uh, otherwise, you know, you might have to have VC funding and a lot of spare time or, you know, be independently wealthy in order to actually get something off the ground. With open source, you could just start hacking on it and do what Linus Torvalds did and say, hey, I've got this project. It's not very great, but it, you know, gets my system working. Maybe you're interested. Maybe you can help. And then you end up, you know, building the whole Linux operating system around that. Uh, so, yeah, you, you can make your projects come real, become real. That that that's important. Um, of course, if you're working on something and you come to a problem in it, uh, you can contribute that fix back. And so, uh, if if you have something that is uh, bugging you, so to speak, and, and you have a solution for it, you can actually go to the project, work with people, and get that address. Even if you don't have the solution yourself, you could make proposals or even talk about it, and you can interact with the community that does that and get these problems fixed. And because of the sharing model, you're benefiting a lot of other people, and you don't have to, it's not just a fix for yourself, um, everybody else gets the benefit of that. And uh, in doing this, when you interact in that way, um, the next time somebody else has a problem, you know, maybe they're likely to share, you know, their fixes with you, and it's a, a nice um, 
virtuous circle, basically. Um, AI, and, and in doing this, uh, you make these community and connections and talk with people and, you know, uh, get make friends around the world um, who, who put, put it bluntly, will help you in your career because careers are made out of connections and knowing people and connections around the world. And this is an easy way to get involved in things that have a huge amount of impact. There are a lot of these projects that you know every company in the world uses have actually a very small contributor base and getting involved in that contributor base will, will get you involved in things that are vital to so many different companies and build up your skills and build up those connections that um, will will benefit you in your life and your career. So um, the connections are good from the selfish career point of view and also it's awesome to make friends around the world and talk with people and chat. Um, in fact, um, during this uh, coronavirus lockdown times, uh, Fedora uh, tomorrow night, we're having an open hour, social hour. You're all invited to it. Follow me on Twitter and find find this, uh, where we just kind of come and hang out and just you know be friends together because it's not just all about the business connections, but it's about the friendships and things we make as well in these projects. So it, that's a real real benefit in both you know practical and um, impractical but important ways and especially like, the skills that you learn in doing these connections are uh, things that you can't really learn in a class you can't learn on your own um, the connections and skills of talking to other people in the world collaboration um, how to um, convince other people that your idea has merit how to uh, work with people even though they don't think your idea has merit when you really think it does, uh, how to, uh, and just some of the tools as well that are used for sharing and collaboration, like um, experience is the only way to learn those things. And again, from a very pragmatic point of view, when you go to a company and they can see that you've been successful in operating in an open source project like that, that is makes it so much easier to be confident in making a hire because what you've done is visible and we can see that you're it, not just that your your code is good but that you can collaborate and work with other people so um, open source participation is super valuable for that as well um, yeah and other things that my daughter has wisely written on this slide uh, you you can learn from seeing other people there's a lot of mentorship uh, opportunity, you know, opportunities to be mentored in uh, open source and in learning learning more skills, learning how to work together at the project, kind of things. Um, and uh, being part of the community also lets you, if you're interested in one area, um, a lot of, like I said earlier, most of these communities need help in so many different areas. Um, you can find things that are kind of adjacent to what you've been working on and learn more about those things and pick up new skills that you weren't even expecting to. Uh, so, yeah, open source, it's good for you. Uh, there, that, that's the end of my slides. All right, well, thank you, Matthew. And this is the point where I said uh, the students would be very interactive and ask lots of questions. So let's see, uh, let's see if they live up to this. So uh, who's going to go first? Who's going to break the ice? <laughs> Let's well, do video. I, so there's Mike. Um, video, yeah, sure. <laughs> I like to see people. <laughs> awesome. Did that? Sorry, now my it's like freezing. Oh, you can see me yeah. though. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Okay, but um, yeah. So I was just curious because it's like on Windows, you have the uh, they released that Windows subsystem for Linux, um, where it like allows you to go into like their marketplace and you can download like say like yeah like a fedora i think it's called like fedora remix or like ubuntu or whatever yeah. so i have that i have the ubuntu one like what's like i was just curious like if there's like the dip between like this just having that like as like that separate little kernel within windows versus like just having the whole operating system of fedora you know like just downloaded separately onto your computer yeah, so um, especially with the first version of Windows Subsystem for Linux, that's actually running under the Windows kernel with the Linux emulation layer. And um, one of uh, the tools team people tells me that that actually 
doesn't do math right. So some of the <laughs> floating point gives you the wrong answers. So um, there's things like that to be wary of. Um, yeah. The WSL2 actually runs a proper Linux kernel, so it's closer to that. Um, but you'll still get better performance. Um, and things like interacting with the graphics layer and so on, if you're doing graphics programming you know, or running graphical applications, they're obviously going to work better with a native um, operating system. Um, yeah. I think there's also a non-technical answer to this, which is, um, I also I get a lot of people with their I'm running a Mac it just works it's got some kind of Unix like thing I've got a perfectly good command line why would I waste my time running you know Fedora on the, my system when I've got a Mac that works and, uh, to me this is about this um, this is an operating system that belongs to us and by us I don't mean just you know I don't mean Red Hat for sure I don't mean just Fedora this is like Linux this this is the operating system of the people. Like this is something that we made and we can be proud of and you can be part of that and it's something that we really own and control and it isn't just um, somebody else's decisions over what can happen and where it can go. So I think it is worthwhile to have for that because this is you know, the community operating system and we are the community. We, it is it's the operating system of the people. Uh, and so I, I think there's just a lot of value in that, in um, kind of what, what that gives you as a human being. And I know that sounds dramatic, but I, I really think it's true because uh, it's something that's ours rather than something that's, um, you know, belongs to you know, um, distant uh, corporations, which despite the law are not actually people. <laughs> no, that, yeah, that makes sense. I. So, so like I, I don't know. Like I've heard, like with um, like Steam Marketplace, with like that the the gaming marketplace. Like it's like they were trying to move everything over to more like a Linux based thing because they're like we're afraid of like the licensing that Windows has with Windows being more so like the prominent gaming OS. Um, so yeah, I don't know. That was, but that it it is interesting. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I, uh, as the mainstream OSs, I mean, they, they look enviously at smartphones and how locked down the app stores are in general on smartphones and how they're getting a cut of every app that's sold on those. And, uh, you know, the support burden is lower. I think um, bo both Apple and Microsoft would like their consumer desktop to be more like a phone. Um, and I think that's... That that's a trend we're going to see more of, and I hope that um, I, I think that more people will be running interested in running Linux. Who the people who are interested in having a computer that is theirs, that they have control of, that they can make content on, that they can make changes to, and that isn't just a phone. And that's a small seg segment of people. Most people don't actually want a computer like that. For most people, a computer is a horrible nightmare they have to put up with in order to get to Facebook and the application, you know, the, the communications and sharing applications that they want. Um, but for some of us, I think we really do want a, a computer. Um, and I think for for those of us, you know, having a Linux operating system that is uh something that belongs to us and something you can you can really hack on is always going to be important. So I think I'm optimistic for our share of the desktop. I'm not going to say year of Linux on the desktop quite yet, but I think we'll get there. <laughs> Other questions? Matthew, I... Uh... Okay, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm interested uh, in the sort of release approach for Fedora. H how is it that you come to the decision that a new release has to be uh, put out there? Yeah, so a Fedora goes on a six-month cadence, um, so which is fairly fast. Uh, and part of this is, to be honest, we inherited that from Red Hat Linux from the 90s. That's how often they put out minor releases, and we started kind of following that. But it turns out to be a pretty good cadence, and it kind of fits with um, a lot of the major software that we integrate. So I, I talked about it being an integration project. 
So the GNOME software puts out a release twice a year. And actually, um, Python, the programming language, recently realigned their cycle so that they are aligned with the Python releases come out uh, to align with Fedora releases on the same kind of cadence. So we get a new release, kind of has a new batch of upstream software every six months. Um, and we actually, in the last couple of years, have really um, solidified that we're doing basically a early May, late October release every year. So um, that's our six month windows. And we really try to hit basically the same time every year. So we have a predictable cadence because that helps those projects that depend on us to get the software to users in a consistent way. They know what to expect and then users know what to expect as well. Um, in doing that, we actually have a pretty strict set of release criteria that our QA team puts together that you know says this must work, this must work, and we've got a process where um, you know once we have a beta release, we go through those blockers and we make sure that each one of those is resolved. So uh, if we do not have those blockers resolved by the release time, we will slip. But the last couple of years, we haven't had to do that at all because we've had pretty good discipline in making sure that things work on the schedule. I know there are some other distros, Arch being the, the trendy one, that go for what's called a rolling release model. That is, they don't have a major version. They just put updates into the stream as the, as the OS comes out. And as somebody working on an operating system, I see the appeal of that because all of this QA and formalization around making a release is a lot of work. But I think that the benefits actually accrue more to the developers than to the users. And I think a release-based cycle lets people digest change in a uh, regular way. So there was a thread on Reddit about, hey, rolling release users, has this ever been a problem for you? And everybody says no, you know, and then the caveats are, I read the release notes every day before I apply updates, or, you know, sometimes my system doesn't boot, but for me, that's not really a problem, the, those kind of things. So with, with the rolling release, um, you kind of are at the mercy of the upstreams for when you're going to, uh, when, when you're going to get new versions of things. If it, if it, you basically make a bargain. If I want to get security updates, I'm going to apply whatever is coming down the pipe whenever it shows up. Whereas um, with our release model, we try to uh, we, we try to make it so that big changes happen on those release boundaries um, while still moving fast enough that new software is available to people quickly. To sort of follow on that, Matthew, I guess um, my question would be, and again, I think I understand, but it would be good to hear from you. I mean, the transition to downstream, you know, so downstream uh, CentOS is the first stop, I guess, once we, you know, cut a Fedora, you know, um, release, I guess, at what point does CentOS get cut? I mean, what's the backporting, you know, because things are going to change yeah. upstream, you know, so it would be interesting, I think, to hear that kind of model yes. as well, what we do. So this is, is very specific to the Red Hat um, and Fedora and CentOS relationship. And actually, we are, CentOS is, they're making some changes to all this with a new thing called CentOS Stream. So I'm going to distinguish between CentOS Linux, which is the classic CentOS, and CentOS Stream, which is the new thing. Um, so the basic process is uh, every few years, and Red Hat is committed actually to making this every three years. So we'll see if they're able to stick to this. I, I think so. I work with the people who are, who are working on the schedule and making it. But uh, the idea is you know, every three years after RHEL 8 came out, RHEL 9 is going to come out and so on. Uh, and the way it's worked um, historically is the uh, at, at some point Red Hat takes a Fedora release after it's been released and uh, branches that internally, makes an internal version of it, re and um, changes some of the build flags to some of the more enterprise-friendly settings, maybe um, targeting more server hardware than Fedora uh, generally targets, um, and then builds a rel candidate internal internal um, bootstrap from that and then builds that up into uh, eventually an alpha and a beta release of RHEL. And then sometime along there, they generally rebase to an updated Fedora release. So basically two Fedora releases go into feeding the beginning of a RHEL. And then after that, 
so this is this is the problem now that CentOS Stream has uh, ex exists to um, exists to solve because so we've got that great collaboration uh, and you. Uh, it, the new development for a new RHEL release happens. It goes into Fedora until that branch off happens. Then after the branch off, all the development for RHEL basically happens internally. And so things that happen, even though RHEL continues to make roughly six month updates to their point one releases, all of that development happens internally and nobody knows what's going to happen um, in, you know, as, a, as a RHEL customer until that point one release comes out. And if you need a fix or, and of course, uh, Red Hat is very conservative about what goes into those point releases, but they do get new software and new features. You know, you know, container technology went into a point release of RHEL because some of these, you know, industry technologies happen faster than a, even a three-year release can happen. So sometimes big things go into these point releases. And as it has existed, that has not really been um, done in a community transparent way. It's basically done as an internal product way. So, uh, so it, it goes from Fedora to RHEL, and then uh, the traditional CentOS Linux actually happens all the way down the bottom of the um, waterfall, where they take the RHEL source packages and rebuild them into the traditional CentOS distribution. So, uh, one of the, the problems we have uh, with that right now are, um, there becomes a pretty big disconnect between the open source world I and mean, the community. It's still open source, of course. The source is available in, in under open source licenses, but the community world and you know, that's in Fedora. And you know, when we get to something like uh, you know whatever Red Hat uh, Linux, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7.6 or so, there's really been you know six releases of this that have been developed internally that haven't really had community participation in them. So CentOS Stream uh, actually is going to happen so that um, we'll have in, in, in our public repositories uh, the branches that are going to become the next RHEL point release. So RHEL 8.3 or whatever will actually live in, in a repository, and that will be the CentOS stream release um, and released as a, pro, you know, as a project um, that you can consume and, and um, provide feedback on. Although unlike Fedora, kind of an important distinction is the CentOS, CentOS stream is sort of a transparent, moderated operating system where Red Hat makes the decisions about what's going in. So if you have a bug fix that goes into CentOS Stream, a Red Hat engineer is going to review and decide if that is something that goes in that minor release or if it's something they don't want or if something that maybe it should go back into Fedora first and come in through that way. Whereas in Fedora, uh, anybody, you don't have to work for Red Hat. You can be the owner of a package. You can be the owner of a fundamental core package and make decisions as a community member about that. Uh, so send, so that's kind of the distinction there. It's a confusing model, but it seems to work okay, okay for us, I guess. Did that answer your question? Did I, did I confuse uh, things even more? No, it, it answered my question, thank you. And, it, um, and, and, and again, I think it, um, Shows the value of CentOS. It's just that much closer to RHEL. I mean, a lot of people take it. It's still free. You can go get it. It's an open source project. So, you know, yeah. CentOS versus Fedora is an interesting choice, right? I mean, and you know, I guess yeah. if you want bleeding edge or do you want something that's more stable, I guess would be the yeah. delineation. We we try to stay away from bleeding edge and just stay to the leading edge. So we'll, we'll let let uh, we we try to make sure we do have high high quality. So it is just leading, and the the blood ends up somewhere else. Um, but yeah, so that. I guess I think there's there's actually um, yeah several differentiators. One of them is that um, that you know more frequent update cycle, which generally means newer uh, newer software. Uh, but another one is this community involvement and ownership. So in traditional CentOS, um, you know if you find a bug um, and that bug also exists in RHEL. CentOS says that's not a bug. That's not a CentOS bug. It's doing what we're we're bug for bug compatible with RHEL, so this is not a bug. Um, and and then um, you go and try and convince Red Hat that it's important to them, and they say, do you have a customer support case? And then so on. Um, so uh, CentOS Stream is hopefully will smooth that interaction a, a little bit, but it is still not a your ownership kind of thing. So in, in Fedora, again, it's community owned. Uh, so 
it, Fedora is, if you want to really participate in, in this thing of our operating system, Fedora is the place um, to be involved. Thank you. Student question. <laughs> Sean, Sean usually asks a lot of stuff. Sean, you uh, any questions for you? Or you're... I have a question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, go yeah. ahead, Ryan. Okay, uh, hi, my name is Ryan. Um, so I know that you mentioned that you originally got into uh, computers based on the uh, at your school, they had the, the Apple II computers, and you designed a game on it. And uh, I know you also mentioned that you created the, the video game for your wife because she was missing out on that game on your old computers. Um, I was just wondering if you're still actively doing that as a hobby, making video games, or if that was just kind of a couple. Uh, no, I actually... Five. I actually have do have one in development that I started last Christmas and then worked on a little bit more this next Christmas. So that's about a spare time I have to do on this hobby. But um yeah, I um there's a game called Oxygen Not Included, which is one of um uh, th there's a lot of these uh games. It, it's kind of in the um War Fortress kind of genre of things, but uh it, it's its whole thing is you've got some little little people who are crash landed on the inside of an asteroid somehow, and you've got to uh, mine your way out and make sure you're providing you know the oxygen and other things they need to survive. And I was playing that, and um, one of the things it's it's got a it's got an interesting physics simulation in it. But one of the things that kept bugging me is there's no conservation of matter. Like things keep getting created and destroyed all the time. So I was like, what if I make a game that's kind of like this, but um, everything is you tries to follow you know real just the best I, best I can um, you know re, the physics of if you have a chemical reaction you're going to get the proper amount of elements back out of that chemical reaction if there's a fire the result you know will be the things that would be the result of a fire if you breathe some oxygen the carbon dioxide is going to come out in the way carbon dioxide does plants are going to grow by taking carbon out of the air. I, I don't know. So I'm working on that a little bit. Um, I got distracted. Uh, my daughter will, will uh, laugh at me a little bit because I also decided um, that instead of having um, square tiles for this, I was going to use hex tiles. And it turns out programming hex tiles is just a whole nother, um, you know, maze of complication that I probably could have the physics part that I was really interested in actually going if I hadn't been working so much on making my hex engine work. Um, but that, that's that's the fun of hobby programming. I'm not on any, any deadlines for this. But uh, yeah, may, maybe in a couple of years I'll have something to show off here. I don't even have anything online for this yet because it's really not at an interesting stage. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. That was an awesome question. Uh, I guess just uh, I guess just a little follow-up question on that is um, would you ever want to do that uh, game development pr professionally or would you want to just keep it as kind of like a side hobby? I think I'll keep it as a side hobby because I am too easily distracted and um, also yeah you know, like I you know said the gaming industry is a harsh place to work um, and I think in order to make a really there there are some you know, small indie games that are successful, but most of them you know require a lot of a lot of late high pressure nights working on a team that's all under pressure and um i don't I don't think i'm am interested in that in this point of my life. maybe if I were twenty years younger uh, i I could handle it, but I think it's a hobby thing for me at this point. That makes sense. Thank you. All I can think of in game development is Kurt Schilling. That was a very uh, disaster. <laughs> right. <event>. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, That's lots of money, drama. lots of not success. You know, it's, uh, yeah. And, uh, so. uh, uh, I have a question. question. Uh, so you talked about uh, doing uh, or working with IoT as your job, but uh, have you decked out your home in, in like a home security system that's connected to IoT or something like that? Or is this mostly work? I've, I've, got, 
I've got this thing here, Rockbox, sitting right next to me here. Um, but I basically got it booting up and haven't had a chance to do things. Part of my problem here is my house was built in around 1890, and it has like five different generations of wiring. Um, and I, I can't bring myself to do smart light bulbs that then have a switch that I have to tape over on the wall or something. So I want to replace the switches. And this is one of those things where um, the perfect is the enemy of the good because I haven't gotten anywhere at all because I feel uh, depressed about my, my wiring being bad and not being able to change the switches that I want to. So incrementally over time, I'm going to get uh, the wiring up to modern state so I can uh, put smart devices in there to get those things. But All I right. have not fun with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> uh, hi, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, by the way, my name is Erastus. So I was just wondering, right, you said that it's possible to get your projects, so to get like people to contribute to your project. Well, how do you go about that? Um, yeah, so I think um, first it, it helps to have something that you're passionate about or interested in, right? So, um, you know, I, I put this, um, the, my, my game that I put up and got contributions back, I made a little website for it. And so I, I, although I, I said I made it just for myself and my wife, you know, I did put the uh, the interest into making a, 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 little, a little site for it and kind of make it, Presentable. I think um, that was you know, before GitHub was a thing. I think you know, putting putting on GitHub and making a nice README, making a tr contributor guide, having a code of conduct, making sure your license is there, um, that can help. And then I think um, start uh, showing it off and you know talking about it in places where people are interested in that kind of thing. You know, social media is huge. Um, depending on what your project is, there's probably some forum where there are people talking about exactly the thing you're interested in. Um, and I think um, once you have the interest, the, the contributions will generally come to it. Um, but also, if you can kind of show off, you know, problems you are solving with with your with your code, um, it's it's harder when it's an earlier state. So um, you know, my game when I got when I got somebody you know, doing that major work on it was already functional. It wasn't just a here's a toy thing. Um, so it helps that. People are going to do things that solve a problem of their own, and that's how you know, people started getting into Linux. So, you know, um, when Linus put up his, you know, thing that worked on his computer, other people took it and made it work on their computer, and then they had, you know, somebody uh, had a, you know, a hard drive, and they wanted it to work on this hard drive, so they, you know, wrote the driver for that to work, and so people solved their own problems and start feeding it back. Um, so I think that if you don't have something where people um, can can solve their own problems um, that that's going to be harder. It also helps to you know have some of the basic things like a uh, well commented code, which is always hard discipline, uh, but make make it easy to understand what you're doing um, so that other people can easily look at it and say, oh, I, I get what's happening here. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, I think it can also help if the thing you are working on, you know, is is something that fits into a wider project. Uh, where if you have, um, you know, it, maybe it's a maybe it's a tool that could be useful in, you know, uh, Fedora IoT or in, useful in an IoT thing, and you can kind of get it integrated into a project that has other people working on something next to what you're doing. So that there's already a community of people around the general problem set, and the, this is kind of that. Um, thing on that uh, slide my daughter made about um, you know people doing interesting things next to what you're doing. You can be one of the interesting things next to what other people care about and they think then they'll see your thing there and uh, you know maybe end up helping out with that as well. All right, thank you. Okay, last chance. I'll take that as a no. No more questions. So uh, I'm going to stop the recording and just say thank you, Matthew. Uh, it was very enjoyable today, so appreciate it. And um,